Welcome to T-Mobile Tuesday Night Baseball on Fox Sports North. It's a beautiful night for some interleague baseball. And it's going to match up on the mound tonight as the visitors bring in Jesse Hahn. He's 4-0 on the road with an ERA of 1.50. And for Minnesota, their most consistent starter all season long. Phil Hughes, 10 wins, solid ERA, but three losses in a row. Welcome inside Target Field on a perfect night for baseball. If you blink, you're going to miss this hometown. The Twins just had six games on the road. They're here tonight and tomorrow afternoon, and then it's right back on the road to go to Oakland and Houston. So let's take a look at the series setup for this quick two-game matchup with the San Diego Padres. We'll start with the Twins on the road. They've been great. Three and three road trip, eight and four in their last 12. They scored 32 runs in Chicago in three games over the weekend. Good offense, could beat some good defense and pitching as San Diego's pitching has really been improving. And since June the 18th, the Padres ERA 2.30 which is number one in all of baseball. The matchup has favored the Twins. They won both games earlier this year at Petco Park in San Diego. In fact, the Twins have won their last eight games at, against the San Diego Padres. It was a fun Sunday of baseball. The Twins belted out 16 runs, 32 and all over the weekend. Now, can the offense carry over? When we come back, Dick Kramer and Roy Smalley, what the Twins need to do to keep the numbers coming in. home improvement needs at Menard. By Budweiser. Great times are waiting. Grab some buds. And by Jeep. Hurry in and get a great deal during the Jeep Summer Clearance event. It is the briefest of possible homestands. Two games in less than 24 hours tonight. And then tomorrow at noon, the Twins will play a two-game series with the Padres. Coming off the most prolific run scoring three game series in all of baseball. There are 32 runs scored in the three games on the south side of Chicago. See what happens here tonight between the Twins and the Padres. Dick Bramer and Roy Smalley for the opening game of this very brief two game homestand. It wasn't just the 16 runs on Sunday, it was the 16 runs 
eight of them Friday, eight of them Saturday. The entire series long was a really good series for the Twins hitters. And this may be hard to believe, but I really think that the Twins starting the series against Chris Sale stuff is what jump started the offense. You know that you're not going to get too many pitches that you can handle. You better swing at the first good fastball that you see that you can hit. They did that against Sale Friday night. It carried over. They did it Saturday and Sunday in spades. And the interesting thing to me, Dick, they have been a team that has looked a little tentative to me at the plate in many streaks during the course of the season. These three games, they went up there hacking. They proved how well they can hit when they're aggressive. For most of Ron Gardenhire's tenure as a manager of the Twins, he's been in search of a leadoff man. He's not had many prototypical leadoff hitters. It looks like he's got one now in Danny Santana. Yeah, Danny Santana, when he first came up and was swinging the bat really, really well, we thought, okay, not too many games in AAA. How long can this last? He had a little injury, missed 17 games, came back a little rusty. We thought, well, maybe this will be the turning point. Maybe he needs some more seasoning. He has picked up right where he left off, hitting the ball well, hitting high for average, driving in every run that he's looked at out there, and igniting that offense from the uh, top spot. He's been really exciting. The Twins and Padres met in the middle of May in San Diego. The Twins won that two-game series. Back then, both teams were struggling to score runs. Now both teams are scoring them in bunches. Vargas has his first hit and his first two runs batted in. Blasted to right center field. Gone a home run. And it is a five hit afternoon for Danny Santana. Deep to left off the bat of Fryer. Twins have gone back to back to back. We thought the Twins broke out offensively Friday night and Saturday night, but they scored 16 more here today. And so after an off day yesterday the twins uh, have welcomed now a new player Jordan Schaefer. He will uh, run out to left field in uh, tonight's game. We expect to see him in center field primarily another option. And if you want to just simply describe him as Sam Fold's replacement for the time being we'll let you do that because the twins need another outfielder after uh, Fold was traded back to the Oakland A's. There's Bud Black a good pitcher in his time primarily with the Kansas City Royals. Has seen his team play really good baseball since the All Star break. In essence, the Padres have played the type of ball the Twins were hoping to play coming out of the break. Here's the Menards batting order for the Padres Everett Cabrera and Hervis Solarte, Seth Smith, Tommy Medic has been white hot since the break. 
Jed Jerko, Will Venable, Yasmani Grandal, Yonder Alonzo, and Chris Nelson. Phil Hughes on the mound for the Twins, looking to uh, get back on that uh, track win that saw him pitch nine very good ball games, seven and two record right in the middle of the season. Been a little bit spotty since then, looking to get back on track tonight. Cabrera, Solarte, and Smith will hit here in the first inning. Mentioned the Twins are out in San Diego in the middle of May, and the Twins won a couple of low-scoring ball games. Both teams were struggling to score runs. And now we've told you what the Twins have done over the last weekend, scoring 32 runs in three games in Chicago. Since the All-Star break, no team in the National League has scored more runs than the Padres. The Padres, who were struggling so mightily to score runs when the Twins saw them last. And the first pitch to Cabrera, a strike. Hughes shut them down in San Diego, scattering seven singles over seven shutout innings. Two strikes to Cabrera. All of a sudden, since the break, not only have the Padres uh, started, especially starting pitchers, done very, very well, but their numbers two, three, four, six hitters have been white hot at the plate. And on three pitches, Cabrera takes a trip back to the dugout, one down. A little cutter or, or a straight fastball that, uh, that didn't cut, but, but cut the outside corner. Northland for defense for the Twins. Jordan Schaefer making his Twins debut on left field. Very speedy player. Santana in center. Arcia in right. Kloof, Escobar, Dozier, Vargas, the infielders, and Suzuki behind the plate. Up and in under the arms of Jan Hervis Solarte. Solarte played against the Twins as a member of the Yankees at third base. And the Twins were in the Bronx. Chopped to the right side. Vargas spears it. And he feeds Hughes close enough to away. And two quick outs here in the first will bring up Seth Smith. Seth Smith, one of those guys, been swinging the bat very, very well. As a matter of fact, the three and four hitter Smith and Tommy Medica since the All Star break, very, very good numbers. They and uh, Will Venable really supplying a lot of the run production for the uh, for the Padres here since the break. They've had three games since the break where they've scored 10 or more runs. Back when the Twins faced them in May, 10 runs was about a week's worth of runs, and that, right. that's not an exaggeration. Right. One and zero oh to Smith, but Black will tell you that they just they realized it was going to take time. They thought they were on a good. Plan with the largely young and inexperienced lineup, and that things would get better in the second half. But I don't know that anybody thought the turnaround offensively would be this dramatic. One and one to Smith, and there's a base hit over Plouffe's head into left. You will see on every ball hit to left center, through center, and into right center, the patched up outfield grass. That the result, of course, of the McCartney concert held here on Saturday and uh, the Twins have two games to play here and then uh, they'll be on the road for a week and I suspect by the time we get back the patchwork will be blended in and grown up uh, with the rest of the green grass here. The main thing is the playing field is uneven as the color looks the uh, playing field is uh, in remarkably good shape. Here's Medica. Ball one. I asked Larry DeVito this afternoon when I got to the ballpark how this uh, chore was different than the Kenny Chesney uh, concert last year and the Chesney McGraw concert the year before. And he said, well, the McCartney concert here on Saturday had a lot more uh, technology to it pyrotechnics and things like that. And of course, with all of that, it took uh, more weight on the stage and the area around the stage. One and one to Medica. Medica, the designated hitter. The Padres, of course, typically don't utilize one, but now in an American League ballpark, they can get an extra bat into their lineup. 
two and one. The National League teams just really aren't built that way for that uh, to have a guy on the bench that is a uh, prototypical designated hitter type. Swing and a miss, two and two. The designated uh, hitter tonight, Medica, who swings the bat like an American League designated hitter, but that puts uh, Yonder Alonso at first base and hit, hit, hitting in the eighth spot at 217. That's not going to get it in the American right. League as a first base DH combination. Two and two to Medica. And now a full count with two gone. Smith will leave early from first. Hughes trying to pick up win number 11 on the year. Wins 50 and 60 on the season. And Hughes trying to end a personal three game losing streak. Runner goes, pitch popped up. And Vargas crosses the line with room, squeezes it to end the inning. A two out single does no damage, no score after a half. Brian Dozier, Trevor Plouffe, Josh Willingham, Kenneth, Kenny Vargas, Oswaldo Arcia, Kurt Suzuki, Eduardo Escobar, and then Jordan Schaefer. And on the mound for the Padres, Jesse Hahn has come out of relative, no, relatively nowhere to go uh, seven and two with a two runs per nine inning ERA. Look at these numbers, opponent average. 182 and he pitches extremely well on the road so far. Padres out on the field brought to you by Northland Ford. And Hervis Solarte in left. Will Venable in center, Seth Smith in right. Chris Nelson, Everett Cabrera on the left side of the infield. Jed Jerko and Yonder Alonso on the right side. And Yosmani Grandal behind the plate. Santana with a five hit game Sunday in Chicago. He will lead things off. And a pitch outside, ball one. Santana, Dozier, and Plouffe. Scoring 32 runs in three games in Chicago after having a real tough time scoring runs in Kansas City. And the point should be made, Roy, that much of that carnage was done against a battered and beaten and bad Chicago bullpen. One and one. On the ground. Bobbled. Recovery made. And Jerko throws out Santana one away. That'll bring up Brian Dozier. 
The first look at uh, Jesse Hahn, the All America scouting report on him. He's got two fastballs. He'll throw a four seam straight fastball and a two seam uh, sinker riding fastball that we just saw him throw to Danny Santana. His best pitch might be his curveball. He's got a really good over the top curveball. And as we've already seen, he wants to pitch away just like that. He was on the outside corner to Santana for two straight pitches. Starts Brian Dozier off with a fastball on the outside corner. One strike to Dozier. Into the corner. And Dozier starts this brief homestand with an extra base hit. A one out double for Brian Dozier. A nice at bat by Brian Dozier picking up where the Twins left off. The, kind of the strategy that they employed in Chicago. First good fastball you see in the middle of the zone. Don't be waiting on anything. As you see, Brian Dozier's scalded line drive. He just over the outreached glove of the Padres' third baseman, Chris Nelson. But no more being tentative for the Twins hitters. Get up there, you see a fastball in the middle of the zone. Go to attack him. And that's that's what they did in Chicago, and Dozier starts him here. Kloof takes a fastball on the outside corner. Don't expect Han to give up three home runs in a row. In fact, the Twins might not hit one at all here tonight. He's not given up a home run in his last seven starts covering 50 innings. Breaking ball off the plate, one and one. First time through, it wouldn't surprise me to see the uh, Twins take a uh, the first pitch that uh, Han delivers. First pitch of each at bat, the first time through. They've never seen him before, but after the first pitch, I would expect them to continue their aggressiveness. Another breaking ball off the plate, two and one. At some point, he's going to have to throw that for a strike, isn't he? Yeah. If if uh, he can't show them that he can get that pitch over, then they're going to be sitting on fastballs like every pitch is three and one. That's what he's been, uh, how he's been successful so far, is that throwing that pitch over. Off the plate, three and one, Willingham on deck. So a good opportunity here for Trevor. He's, Trevor, he's got three and one count. He's seen a fastball or two, seen a couple of curves. He should be sitting on the fastball, probably middle away. Go ahead and drive it to right center. Takes it up high and he fills first base with a walk. And that will bring up Willingham. Talk all you want about how much fun the Twins had over the weekend in Chicago, specifically Sunday. It was not a good day for Josh Willingham. He left 10 men on, went one for seven. Josh has not been swinging the bat. In typical Josh Willingham fashion uh, this year, but and it's too bad it, it always happens to somebody in a game like that when everybody's hitting. There's going to be somebody that doesn't get in on the act. It, Sunday just happened to be Josh. Runs with a chance here in the first inning against Jesse Hahn. And missing again. It was a four pitch walk to Plouffe and now ball one to Willingham. You see the catcher Grandal just moving right out there to the outside corner. That's where Han wants to pitch. He just he wants to pitch everything away. And he's thrown the curve five times. I think he's missed the strike zone with all five. 12 pitches, just five strikes. One of them whacked into the corner for a double. Two and oh, six straight out of the strike zone from Hahn. Pop straight up in the air. An infield fly rule finally is called, but it's a foul ball. Willingham only moved the ball outward about. 12 feet and about a mile in the air, two down. Right now, for a look at our T Mobile game changer, Kenny Vargas will always remember his first series in Chicago, driving in four runs. Well, he's got a very, very 
good and relatively compact and controlled swing for as big a man as he is. And we've already seen in batting practice he can hit the ball nine miles. And it's not because he has a big long swing either. It's pretty pretty accomplished. Foul away. Team took early batting practice here. Vargas was just hitting bombs <laughs> all over the place. And of course he was here for the futures game and hit the ball. Uh, during batting practice and then played in the game and he said he thought the ball really carried well here at Target Field <laughs> which good I, I hope his teammates were listening <laughs> when you are as strong as he is the ball will carry well anyway one strike to Vargas and a strike called oh and two. I asked Vargas today about his switch hitting. He said he started switch hitting about a month before the Twins signed him. And he says he's just as good right handed as left handed originally as most switch hitters were a right handed batter learning how to hit left handed. And there's the breaking ball that the White Sox exploited uh, to Vargas. Hans got a good one and he strands two men in the first. Fan photo for a chance to have it shown in an upcoming game broadcast brought to you by AT&T. Jed Jerko, Will Venable, Yasmani Grandal will hit for the Padres here in the second. A night game tonight, a noon game tomorrow, and then the Twins head to the West Coast to take on the A's, and then from there they go to Houston. Pulled foul, one strike. Padres playing good baseball, 10 and 5 since July 19th. Continuing to get great pitching. And now starting to hit the ball a little bit better. Breaking ball over for a strike and one two. Yeah, good pitch there. And a pitch that I'd really like to see Phil Hughes use a lot. He's got a good breaking ball. He, and it's around both leagues now. And here comes a breaking ball again. A little cutter on the inside, a little what they call a front door cutter. Inside corner. Starts off inside, breaks it right back on the corner. That's a nice pitch. Two strikes. Looks like you can see uh, Jorko's uh, knees buckle just a little bit. Looks like a fastball inside and then cut. What, why we say cutter cuts back over the inside corner and we're talking movement of what two three inches maybe. Yeah that may be a little bit more that may be four or five but not much. And uh, that's the that's the beauty of the of the cutter because it just moves supposedly what what we're trying to do is just move it off the big end of the bat just enough. Here's Venable. 
in relation to the plate you can start it off the plate as Hughes does and bring it back over or just the opposite right you can put it on the outside corner and then have it move those four inches off the plate that's that's what you normally see Hughes do against right handers left handers he'll uh, uh, he'll try to backdoor it a little bit which means that same corner he just threw it to but the guys on the other side of the plate and he gives up on it thinking it's an outside fastball and it cuts back over the corner just like Jorko thought it was inside it cut back over the corner three and one he was one of the best control pitchers in either league just three walks in July four walks in June none in May and six in April Aye, aye, aye. Oh, that ball landed in the walkway area. Vargas goes to the bag to make the play. The uh, splintered bat sailed over one section of fans and uh, in front of another. So everybody should be okay. Two down. Deep in the kitchen there. Ball just bouncing over the bag. Constitute a fair ball, and as you said, the uh, most of the bat ending up in the stands. Two down, and here's Yasmani Grandal. But you're right, Dick. Phil Hughes is a very, very good control pitcher. He's going to throw that fastball and the, to some degree the cutter over the plate almost every pitch. He's just coming at you, and as I started to say, that's gotten around the American League. I'm sure the National League teams have a scouting report as well. That's why I like the, the slower breaking ball. Just a, a, a different speed to get him off that uh, that fastball speed. Because what we're seeing from opposing hitters is there's no waiting. They know he's throwing it over. They know he's throwing fastballs. They get geared up right away. He's got to throw something else to get him off of that fastball. Like that. That's a nice pitch. Foul tip. Still two strikes. Well, if you don't walk people and you keep the ball in the ballpark, you necessarily almost demand two three hits in an inning to even score a run and to say that he only walked three guys in July that doesn't uh, tell but half the story thirty four and two thirds innings two strikes and a base hit so there's a two out single as the Padres pick going up in the first inning the four walks in June in forty one and two thirds innings no walks in May in thirty three and a third. Target fields become the top choice for families throughout Twins territory for all kinds of special occasions, commemorations. Groups of 25 or more qualify for special ticket discounts and can reserve certain seats without a deposit. Organize your family group outing at Target Field. Find out more at twinsbaseball.com slash groups or by calling 833 Twins. Grandal aboard, and here is Yonder Alonzo. Ball one. Alonzo, as Roy mentioned, struggling, hitting just 217. Slow breaking ball, missing 2 and 0. Oh. Swing at a high fastball. A lot of times when hitters get to two and zero oh and they know a fastball is coming, they get uh, pretty excited and uh, don't narrow their strike zone down. You're hitting two and zero. Oh, that high fastball up there is not the one you want to swing at. And now two and two. You just see that so much of the time with uh, young hitters, especially when they get two and zero. They know a fastball's coming. You really need two and zero, three and one. You need to get so selective so you hit exactly, exactly the pitch you want. Otherwise, you're just giving it bats away. He let Phil Hughes right back in the right back in the at bat here. Got behind two and zero, but then gets a swing and a miss on a ball up at eye height. Now he can come right back. He's two and two. He can throw him just about anything. Hit hard to right field. Arcia over now back. Can't make the play. High off the wall to third base. Grundahl is going to be waved around. Dozier's throw to the plate. Suzuki with the catch. Got him. 
Here comes Bud Black. It might be reviewed. Dozier with a long throw to the plate. And Suzuki had to come out in front of the plate to make the catch. And then literally lunge at Grandal for the tag. And everybody being held on the field. Fastball in the middle of the plate. And uh, he RC it takes kind of a bad angle at the ball, but then everybody does a good uh, good job. He makes a one hop good throw to Dozier. Dozier turns around strong through the plate, and Suzuki makes a great attempt at tag. I don't know if he got him or not from that angle. We'll see right here. Mm. Wow. It's going to be close in the replay. I don't know that the tag was ever applied. I haven't seen it yet. No challenge. And I'm wondering why. That's a point on the board, but I did not see any contact made between Suzuki and the runner. Bottom line is no scoring in the second. They're hoping that the momentum they created over the weekend carries over the Twins at 23 hits. Every player that started in that game had a hit. Seven had multiple hits, and Gardy said, absolutely. When you have a game like that, confidence runs through the top and bottom of the order. Everybody feels like they can hit, and even though they're facing a quality pitching team in San Diego, confidence is something you just have to enjoy at the plate. And Gardy thinks if they continue to take it fast the way they did in Chicago, no matter who they're playing, they can score runs. They'll be tested here for sure, but guys, they'll really be tested when they go to Oakland. <laughs> yes, they will. Here's Arcia taking strike one. And now inside one and one. In the uh, Oakland series, the Twins are due to face John Lester, Scott Kazmir, Jeff Samarja, and Jason Hamill. Slow breaking ball over for strike two. Arcia, Suzuki, and Escobar in the twin second. Are 11 and 3 in the interleague series matchup between Minnesota and San Diego. 2 and 2. RC is yet to swing the bat. Must be pitch tapped foul. What the Twins are hoping to see from Arcia is not so much what they saw in his last at bat in Chicago where he pulled one half a mile for a home run. But what they saw before the home run, a more disciplined approach at the plate. And even though that's a foul ball, he stayed back and stayed on the ball and tried to put the barrel on it and hit it hard someplace, not just a right field. Yeah, those are the little steps that, that uh, progress that we're starting to see with uh, Oswaldo Arcia. He's talking with uh, 
that man right there hitting coach Tom Bernanski for the game. Popped up but back in the seats. And uh, Bruno really thinks that he's making some uh, progress with uh, Arcia that, uh, that Arcia is is really taking it to heart and learning. I love the line drive double that he hit to left field uh, to uh, help win that game in Chicago on uh, Saturday I believe it was. And I really didn't like the 450 foot home run he hit because I don't I wanted to get that out of his mind and think more about left field. A high blast to right center field. High and deep. And to the warning track. He just got under it. A deep fly for the first out of the second inning. But a good at bat right there. A really good at bat. Fought off some curveballs. Got to a uh, count where he got a fastball in the middle and just, just got under it. It was a really good swing. So, you know what Bruno's saying right there? Oh, I wish that that had gone only because I want to see some positive reinforcement right. for what we're working on. That's exactly what that look from Bruno was. Here's Kurt Suzuki. And a first pitch strike. One strike to the Twins catcher. And it looked like Suzuki did get the runner on the shoulder right there. Yep, it looked to me like the insignia on his shoulder on the uniform moved just ever so slightly. That's what it looked like. One and one. And the runner, Grandal, I was watching him as he walked away from his manager uh, who was talking to the, uh, to the home plate umpire. He walked away kind of shaking his head and it wasn't a shake of the head like you got to challenge that I, I was in there it seemed the body language seemed to me like he just couldn't believe that he didn't make it in there. One and two to Suzuki. Hope the short right Jerko going out. And here comes the right fielder Smith to make the catch again it was in the second inning if managers or teams were given unlimited challenges. It almost certainly would have been challenged, but if you challenge that one and there's not conclusive evidence, or you just simply lose the challenge, well, then you're done. And we've seen that happen a couple of times. It's not the play so much, but when the play occurs, that discourages a team from challenging. Two down. Here's Eduardo Escobar back in the game as the Twins shortstop. Ball one. Off the knuckles, a foul ball. Alonzo on the track makes the catch. A one, two, three second inning for Jesse Hahn.
Sports North is presented by Century Link, your link to what's next. By Northland Ford. Visit NorthlandFord.com and your local Northland Ford dealers today. And by Grand Casino. The best stories start here. Ron Garden Hire fans are here hoping that the Twins can uh, win a couple games against the Padres. Heading to the third inning, number nine batter Chris Nelson facing Phil Hughes in a fastball one strike. Nelson get a chance, getting a chance to play third base when the Twins were in San Diego in May. Of course, so Chase Headley was still with the team. Headley traded to New York. Headley playing at first base last night for the Yankees, his first game there. A lot of changes for the Padres, and maybe more to come. While the team is here in Minnesota, there are reports that the Padres are imminently going to name their new general manager. They fired their general manager since the Twins were in San Diego. The roster looks different. One and two. A lot of the players, of course, uh, traded. Houston Street traded. And a called third strike. It's the third inning in a row. Where Hughes has started the inning with a call third strike. Down that'll bring up Everett Cabrera. And another cutter that fools a San Diego hitter. This is in a great spot down low knee high. Looks like a fastball breaks over the middle. Saturday MLB on Fox Sports one returns a doubleheader. The Yankees head to the Bronx to face Michael Brantley and the Indians followed by the Cardinals taking on the Orioles. Plus you can catch the twins against Oakland right here starting at 830. Coverage begins Saturday at 11:30 in the morning Central, only on Fox Sports One and streaming live on Fox Sports Go. Be working the road trip with uh, Jack Morris, missing inside one and one. Cabrera called out on strikes his first time up. Foul back one and two. Mentioned the Padres have scored a lot of runs relative to what they were scoring before the break. Beat the Cardinals 12 to 1. Beat the Cubs 13 to 3. Beat the Braves 10 to 1 the other night. Two and two. Phil trying to throw that breaking ball, uh, the slower curve ball. Just not great command of it yet. He doesn't quite have the feel. I know Bert Blylevin, your usual partner, would say throw it again. And he's going to do, Kurt's going to come right back with it. Just upstairs a little bit with Hughes looking off into the right field corner he thought he had that one right at the belt for another call third strike. Yeah I think that fooled uh, the umpire Mike DeMuro you see how late it breaks it starts high and then bites down pretty hard Fox tracks has it high as DeMuro getting the call right both Phil and Kurt thought maybe they'd get that pitch and a walk putting him aboard now with one out. Phil just not real comfortable with his curveball yet it doesn't have the release point feel quite yet. I like how you describe Bert, by the way. You said my usual partner. You didn't call him regular or normal. Well, because I, I think we been, know Bert. It's been a long time since, I mean, regular maybe. It's been a long time since I've referred to Bert as normal. <laughs> and I guess now that I think about it, there are many people out there who might think of him as unusual <laughs> rather than usual. Bert will be back to work after the road trip. Ball one to Salarte. And a ground ball to Vargas his first time up. The thing that I have always loved about Bert Blylevin that is he's been the same guy since he was 19 years old. And that's for the most part a good thing. That's a great thing. That's <laughs> what I love about it. That's what I'm saying. I'm I'm admiring it. I I admire respect and and enjoy that about him. One and a, and there's a strike, and Suzuki with a throw. And 
had it been over the bag, they may have had a play on Cabrera. I haven't seen Suzuki throw to the bases very often. Bird, of course, took some time off because of uh, the Hall of Fame induction and some other things, and uh, very happy to and, have you. And because a short game needed a little work, <laughs> I think. A weak pop up and Ploof across the line makes the catch out number two. Well, I've enjoyed it very much, Dick. I really have. We have one more game to do together uh, tomorrow, and and uh, Bird will be back, I guess, on the uh, right. homestand when the Twins return. It'll be good to have uh, Bert back in this chair. And now Phil Hughes, we got a little uh, debris on the field. It might have been part of a broken bat. I don't know. He's busted a couple of them. Yeah, that last one was a pretty severe handle shot. That probably was a piece of wood. By the way, Bert just texted me. He says he is normal. <laughs> Bert's absolutely normal. I, I, I guess I, I, I'm not going to argue with him on that. He's absolutely normal. It just depends on which meter you're using. <laughs> Two down here in the third. Smith singled his first time up. And a strike. Mentioned that uh, Hughes in San Diego scattered seven singles over seven innings. Smith is five for eight against Phil Hughes over the years. And that cuts over the inside corner, 0 and 2. And now with two strikes, the Twins shift their infield to a more conventional alignment. They were into a pull shift before, not so much with two strikes. Runner goes in the pitch tap foul. Good break by Cabrera. Looked like he had the base stolen. If Suzuki had caught a pitch out of the strike zone. Oh and two to Seth Smith. Part of it is the ballpark that he's pitching in. But Hughes has done a nice job keeping the ball in the ballpark relative to what happened last year when he gave up 24 home runs. In 145 and two thirds inning. Nice block by Suzuki, and it's one and two. So far, in roughly the same number of innings pitched, he's only given up 10 home runs. And a small part of it is the, the ballpark in terms of the actual balls going, you know, flying over the fence. Right center field in uh, Yankee Stadium is a uh, jet stream, and it's Anything but easy hit the ball out of this ballpark in the right center, but he's just pitch better. There's no question. Foul back. He's mixing his pitches better. He's gone to that slower curveball. I think his attitude, his whole mental outlook is better, knowing that uh, getting out of that Yankee Stadium uh, pressure cooker and small ballpark to right field where he would give up a lot of home runs, getting somewhere else, change of scenery, pitching better, all of that applies. And a throw over to Vargas. Well, if you are a fly ball pitcher, you probably don't want anything to do with ballparks like Yankee Stadium, U.S. Cellular Field. We saw the ball shoot out of there. I was amazed at how well the ball carried there at U.S. Cellular. Tap to the right side, and Vargas. Gets it in fair territory. That's a good play by Vargas. Very good play. Had that ball hit the ground a second time, it may have landed across the line. He was aggressive, caught the first top for the third out.
Bottom of the third. Yeah, Phil Hughes, three very good is scoreless innings. Good control of that cutter, which has been his best pitch so far. And the only time we've had even close to a score, it turned out to be very close. Good relay by the Twins. Great diving tag to just nail the hitter at the plate. Keep the score 0-0 zero, zero as we head to the Twins half of the third inning. Jordan Schaefer about to make his Twins debut. Here's what we know in a nutshell or a thumbnail sketch about Schaefer. This is his 10th year of professional baseball started in the Braves organization a couple of years in the Houston organization then back with the Braves for a couple of years picked up on waivers by the twins on Sunday and his first pitch a base hit a fresh start and a very quick leadoff single in his first at bat this guy can run he had just 13 hits for the Braves this year but stole 15 bases fastball just outside the middle and Jordan wastes no time at all. Looking fastball, gets it. Puts a big end of the bat on. A couple years ago in 2013 for the Braves had a decent year going. Hitting a 247, not much power, but 231 at bats. Actually took the baseball out of play. And Schaefer getting his uh, first hit in a for a new club. Here's Santana and we'll keep one eye on Schaefer because he loves to steal bases. And it looked like he had a larceny on his mind there. <laughs> well, manager Ron Gartenhire would like nothing better than to uh, replace uh, Sam Fold's base stealing ability with uh, another fellow that can do it. You could tell by the way Jordan Schaefer was visiting with the uh, San Diego catcher and and now the first baseman there's there's some familiarity he's been in the National League for a while they look up and say hey what are you doing here. They also know that he can. He runs really really well that so Jesse Hunt thrown over there and we'll keep a close eye. Just over a thousand major league at bats, so roughly two full seasons scattered over parts of six seasons. But 88 stolen bases. And he's been caught 22 times, so an 80% success rate. And there he goes. Didn't look like he got a real good jump, however. Head first slide will get him in there. He did not have a very good jump, but he. Made up for it about halfway to second base. He turned on the Jets. He, he really did didn't have a good jump, and he stutter stepped a little bit right there. Looks like he's going to be out, and then all of a sudden he is a flash right to the bag. Good head first slide right to the base. Stays on it, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so he's. Got a base hit on his first pitch as a hitter, stole a first base on the first pitch as a runner, and now a bouncer towards short. They'll try to get him at third, and he's out. Well, that's a pretty quick sequence on three pitches. He has a hit, a stolen base, and a base running mistake. When you're on second base, you're taught to make the ball be behind you. And that almost doesn't count. He made it be behind him with a pretty good jump, but the ball was hit too hard, pretty much right at him. And that's not a uh, that's not a good base running play right there. You can't get thrown out on that ball. So the first out of the inning is at third base. Santana's at first, and he's as apt to steal second as Schaefer was. Down and away, ball one. Dozier cracked a double into the left field corner. His first time up.
I feel for Jordan Schaefer there a little bit. Guy trying to make a good impression with his with his team. He gets a base hit. He gets a stolen base. He's all pumped up and fired up. And he wants to uh, get to third with uh, on uh, the, the ball by Santana and just reacted uh, inappropriately right there. Just not not the right instinct right there. But I, I can really see where that uh, where that would come up when you when you're fired up like that. Santana at first and he's stealing at an 80% success rate. 8 for 10. 2 and 0. 3 and 0 blue on deck. He caught a quick glimpse of Ron Gardner in the dugout with a kind of a, a frustrated look on his face when Schaefer got thrown out of third and I actually think it's for two reasons. It's not just Schaefer's base running play but as we look there at Gardy. He's uh, he was also I think frustrated that it wasn't a better attempt by Santana to hit the ball behind the runner first pitch fastball right there and he doesn't get the ball enough behind the runner to get him over without any of that drama that we just saw. Bell tie strike three and one. So a couple was a couple of not great uh, uh, moves there by uh, both the Twins base runner and hitter. Going to drive right to the sunflower seed bag. <laughs> Santana goes. It's ball four. Not close. And it'll be runners now at first and second. Oof. Will come to the plate, and he too enjoyed a good weekend in Chicago. Uh, he had a phenomenal weekend series there in the three games. Hit the ball all over the ballpark with authority, and he's probably the uh, best example of what I was talking about in the opening of our show or the pregame show about how the uh, Twins hitters got really, really aggressive early in counts on, on fastballs that were there to be hit, not to be taken. Wolf took four wide in the first inning, a four pitch walk. The walk to Dozier essentially covered up the base running mistake by Schaefer. The Twins have the same situation now as they would have had had Schaefer stayed put. And an off speed pitch clips the corner. First and second, one out. Hoping for some run support. One and one. Anything, it looks like Han is relying more and more on his off speed stuff. The word is that I think everybody thinks that's his best pitch. He doesn't throw uh, an overpowering fastball in terms of velocity. He's got a little movement on it. But I think it's pretty clear by now, it should be clear to Twins hitters that. He's not going to come in very often. He might show you that, but he's going to try to stay away with fastballs and breaking balls. You see the target by the catcher right there. Just stay right out there. It can't can't be a real surprise at this point in time. Uh, it's uh, kind of a scouting report that uh, Todd Brunansky had uh, that he was going over with the hitters, and, he, and Han has demonstrated that uh, stayed true to the scouting report. Big breaking ball, fastballs away. One and two. Twins with a scoring threat again here in the third. Dozier is taking a huge lead off of first. Now Alonzo sneak behind him. But it's like Dozier's keeping one eye on the plate and another eye on the runner ahead of him. As if if Santana is gonna go to third, then I gotta follow him to second. Exactly right. And it could be that the twins had uh, the green light there for Santana and, and Brian was expecting him to go. Roll to the right side. Out at second relay to first double play. Well, the Twins had a threat in the first, didn't score. A threat again in the third, and we head to the fourth. Scoreless.
when you find the Mall of America, the nation's largest shopping and entertainment destination, with over 520 stores, restaurants, and attractions. Visit ExploreMinnesota.com. Discover a world that's only in Minnesota. And post your ex Minnesota experiences to hashtag only in MN. Nickelodeon is the largest indoor amusement park. Seven acres of rides, entertainment, Nick characters, attractions, a lot of great food there as well. Tommy Matico will lead off the fourth against Phil Hughes. And the first pitch strike. Medica, Jerko, and Venable, the four, five, and six batters for San Diego. White Sox and the John Danks getting knocked around by the Rangers at 7 0 Texas already. Danks out of the game. Cleveland's getting thumped by the Reds, 6 1 in the seventh. David Price making his Tiger debut against the Yankees, and he's trailing 3 2 in the seventh. Two and one. Phil Hughes showing more frustration on the mound than we've seen from him in a long time. He just doesn't quite have the uh, command that he's used to having. A lot more balls out of the strike zone than he's used to throwing. A lot of missed spots that he's used to hitting. Popped up. Back and out of play. Two and two. We can see that the ball strike ratio uh, right there 35 strikes out of 54. He's, uh, which is not certainly not bad, but it's, it's not Hughes like. Yeah. Two and two. That'll be a called third strike here, doesn't it? All the other innings have started that way. <laughs> and again in the fourth. <laughs> and Maybe somebody ought to uh, come back to the bench and say, hey, watch out for that two strike cutter. <laughs> Especially if you're the leadoff batter in an inning. Exactly. And we've seen that pitch three times. Here's Jerko. He was uh, called out uh, leading off the second inning. There's a good curveball right there. And maybe that'll get there. That'll get the uh, the field going. Eight of 14 first pitch strikes. That's a little bit unused. Like he's usually more in the uh, 10 or 11 out of 14 so far. Just off the corner, one and one. Yeah, another two, two really good curveballs. That one just missed. But sometimes, and I think Bert would say this, sometimes you you finally throw the run, the good one you want, and all of a sudden you got it again. Fastball, a little late, foul tip, one and two. A little late, and that's what that curveball will do to hitters. It just makes them wait just a little bit, and then that sneaky fastball at 93 gets thrown by. Him. That's why it's so important to be able to throw that pitch over. And 93 near the outside corner. Jerko couldn't take a chance, fouled it away. Padre signed Jerko to a multi year deal, and then he's just had a terrible season. Gotten a little bit better to get his batting average to 181. He's had some injury issues. One and two. Going to try the cut the indoor front door cutter again oh, and just missed the inside corner. That's the one he's got the strikeouts on strikeouts looking on right there and just missed. Try it again. And there it is. <laughs> the uh, <laughs> last one was just a little bit tighter to the inside corner, and now Jerko has some words with Mike DeMiro and holding up two fingers, meaning you missed two of them, in, uh, or I've taken two call third strike. Fox tracks presented by Jeep. The final pitch wasn't a whole lot closer to the inside corner than the other one. Two down. Here's Venable. And a little flare in the center. Dozier can't track it down. And now it's another two out single. The Padres have four hits, and they've all come with two outs in an inning. 
And this is what Hughes did in San Diego. He gave up some hits, but scattered them. Didn't allow the Padres to bunch anything together. Another broken bat. This one falls for a hit. Grandal singled with two outs in the second. Tried to score on Alonzo's double, but was thrown out. Barely. A nice relay from Arcia to Dozier to Suzuki. That foul. And let's talk a little bit about that because we were in Chicago, or I guess it was in Kansas City, where the Twins were really guilty throwing to the wrong bases and overshooting cutoff men. And it's really unsightly when you see it, but if there's a lesson to be learned there, it might have been that Arcia learned it. You know, he didn't try to throw to second base as he did the other day in Chicago. He hit the cutoff man on one hop. Dozier had to scoop the ball up and throw home, but at least there was a play to be made. When in Chicago, he just airmailed one to second base, and there was no play to be had. Right. The only uh, mitigating factor for uh, Arcia that day in Kansas City was that there was not a runner on first, it was a runner on second. So a ball hit over your head. You think the guy on second is going to score. That's a double. You think he's going to score. And so he came up throwing the second because the ball bounced hard off the wall to him. He had no idea. Breaking ball in the dirt. Suzuki completes the third strikeout of the inning. Stay tuned for this important message from Mesh Patcher and Smith. I just have to laugh about this. Somebody just tweeted me. Uh, they Googled Roy Smalley and found out that, you, that uh, I think it's in reference to your father, but they have you as deceased on Google. <laughs> October 22nd, 2011. That's when your father passed away, I believe, wasn't it? That's correct. Yes, okay. He is very much alive, and I've enjoyed, work, I've enjoyed working with him. Over the last week or so, as we mentioned, the bird taking some fun. time off. I, I really uh, enjoyed working with you. It's, it's uh, clear you have a passion for the game and specifically for Twins baseball. So, uh, really enjoyed it. Well, thank you, Dick. It's been my great pleasure to work with such a pro as, as you, a Hall of, Minnesota Hall of Fame guy. And uh, it's, it's been my pleasure. Josh Willingham will lead off the fourth and we'll be working again tomorrow. This isn't our swan song here tonight or anything like that. It'll be Willingham, Vargas, and Arcia. And Willingham taps one up the line foul. Twins had a scoring threat in the first, a double and a walk consecutively with one out, and then Willingham hit one that uh, if we were in the Metrodome, that would have hit the ceiling. It went straight up in the air. Caught by Grandal for out number two, and then Vargas struck out. Another scoring threat in the third, first and second, one down, but then Plouffe bounced into a double play. Well, here's a shot, but it's going to be a fastball away. And off the plate. And, you know, when you see 
when you hear a scouting, you see a scouting report, and then you see that guy living up to what you thought he was going to do. Second time through the through the order, you just have to give up on that inside fastball, and and uh, if he throws it in there before he's got two strikes, you just take it. You say, you know, fine. I know I would have liked to hit that if I was looking for it, but I can't look for a pitch. I'm going to get one out of every eight or nine pitches. I have to look out over the plate. So the changeup called for here. Off the plate, three and one. And see, if you're looking out over the plate, looking to hit that ball out over the plate to right center field as a right hand hitter, you're not going to offer that change up in the dirt. You're going to stay on the breaking ball better. If you want to hit the fastball inside, you're just convinced he's going to throw it in there. You end up swinging at bad pitches. And headed up the middle. Nice pickup by Cabrera going to his left, and he throws him out. Very smooth play by Everett Cabrera. Bring up Kenny Vargas. Soup.com trivia question. Who is the only pitcher to win 100 games for the San Diego Padres? I think I know that one. Randy Jones? That, that would be my guess. But I guess I'd be mine. Here's Vargas. Twins or the Padres rather send their third baseman into short right field. And there's a pitch down and in ball one. Vargas struck out on a breaking pitch to end the first inning. Vargas has struck out six times in the big leagues, and I think they have all come on breaking balls down and in. Line viciously to center right at Venable for out number two. Two down, that'll bring up Arcia. Garcia had a long at bat battle on and then hit a towering fly ball to the warning track in right center field. Taking all the way, strike one. One and one. And I guess it's that fastball taken for strike one that I don't understand. That, it, that, that he's already had one good at bat against him, and I, I don't know what else he'd be he'd be looking at. Why and it wasn't just a take like he was thinking uh, curveball. It was just I'm taking this all the way, as you as you said. I'm not I'm not exactly sure about that. It'd be one thing if he first time up or. Popped up one pitch his first time up, but he's seen a lot of pitches, and that's was the pitch he wanted, I think. Yeah, and it's did an off speed yeah. pitch, and it's grounded weakly. And it's a one, two, three, fourth inning for Jesse Hahn.
the Minnesota State Lottery Winner's Circle, a very special night for these two youngsters. Justin and Bridget drove all the way from South Dakota, but there's more to the story. Halfway here, hometown ballpark, Justin stops, takes her to the pitching mound, has a baseball that's been cut up in half, and inside that baseball is a ring. Now the best seats in the house. Safe to say this is something pretty special. How surprised were you? Pretty surprised. When he puts that baseball out on the pitcher's mound, what are you thinking at that point? Is he going to teach you how to throw the curveball like Burt Blylevin? <laughs> I thought he was going to cry, to be honest. <laughs> There's no crying in baseball, guys, but there is an engagement on the pitcher's mound. And now you're being circled by Roy Smalley, who, of course, won a World Series right here with the Minnesota Twins. Very nice. Congratulations. First pitch, a called strike to Alonzo, and now a high blast to right center field. This one way back. And into the second deck, a home run for Alonzo, his sixth of the year. And the first run goes to the Padres. Well, so far, Alonzo is, has not been fooled by Phil Hughes. Second inning, he ripped that double off the right field fence that um, could have been a run for the Padres, if not for the great relay play by the Twins. But here's a fastball in the middle that he's ready for. Powerful swing and hits it a long way. You won't see too many balls up there. On the outside corner to Chris Nelson. Called out on strikes his first time up. Padres playing the best stretch of baseball they've played in quite some time since the All Star break. One of the most disappointing home series. Here this year was a three game series with Houston. The Astros, frankly, outplayed the Twins and won two of the three games and made quite an impression on the Twins. I have, no one's expecting much out of the Astros this year. Similarly, the Padres got off to a terrible start, gone through a lot of changes, but they're uh, playing uh, some really good baseball right now and have the first lead here, one and two to Nelson. Teams that have done this too. One and two. Two and two. When uh, the season is lost in terms of contention, hopes for a championship, there is a re relaxing or almost a calming effect that can go through a clubhouse. Like we don't have anything else to lose. Let's just go out and uh, have fun and and sometimes. It takes that to get the talent to come out of a player or a roster. That's absolutely true. When there's uh, a, a, a sense of relaxation, everybody everybody plays better. But the, the trick is to be able to have that sense of relaxation and fun when the games mean something. Right. That's one hit to left. And a reaching catch for Schaefer who had to go down. With his glove below his knee to catch a sinking line drive one away. Nice play. I think he had to uh, battle the lights and the uh, and the twilight just a little bit in a new ballpark, but caught up with it. Made a nice shoestring catch. Asked him uh, before the game today. He really hasn't played much in left or right as a big leaguer. He's been principally a center fielder. One down in the fifth. Here's Cabrera. It's a Padre team that actually has a higher winning percentage than the Twins. The twins are 50 and 60. The Padres are 51 and 60. And San Diego in the middle of their division. Outside. San Diego plays in a pretty tough division, actually. Yeah. The Dodgers and the Giants. One and one to Cabrera. Oh, foul. One and two. Toughest division, of course, is the American League West. 
three teams above 500 and the Twins will run into the best team in the game at least. In terms of a one loss percentage the Oakland A's four games starting Thursday night. Tapper to the right side easy play for Dozier. Two down. It's not too late to join the Twins season ticket family for 2014. Join as a partial plan holder now receive all the benefits of a season ticket holder for the balance of the season. You can find out more about Twins season ticket holder family. Uh, by joining the family by visiting twinsbaseball.com or by calling 833 twins. Solarte, 0 for 2. Bouncer to first and another two out hit for the Padres. Santana picks it up. And fires it back in. That'll bring up Seth Smith. Padres out hitting the Twins six to two. The only hit that's mattered so far. Alonzo's leadoff home run here in the fifth. Like we uh, suspected, and and other teams that the San Diego Padres would do what other teams have done and just not waste any time waiting on Phil Hughes to run up a pitch count and see a fastball in the, in the middle of the plate. They're swinging at it. Smith with a single and a shattered bat ground ball to Vargas. Clipping the inside corner. Transactions today. The uh, Yankees traded veteran uh, reliever Matt Thornton to the Nationals. And Jim Johnson, the former Oakland closer and Baltimore closer the last couple of years, was picked up today by the Tigers, further bolstering their bullpen. So now the Tigers have Johnson and Soria, Soria and, and Nathan. Nathan. Yeah. All guys that have been premier closers. One and two. And I suspect we'll continue to see players who cleared waivers be traded or picked up by the claiming team. Another capper foul. One and two. 83 pitches for Hughes trying to wrap things up here in the fifth. The home run hit by Alonzo, just the 11th allowed this year by Hughes. The Twins have now allowed 88 home runs and hit 84. Swing and a miss, a strikeout to end the fifth. Somebody finally scored and came on a long home run off the bat of Yonder Alonso.
and start fans of the game. Enjoying uh, summer night at the ballpark. Some uh, red liquor. And hopefully, hopefully a uh, Twins come from behind win. It's one nothing now. And Kurt Suzuki will lead things off in the fifth inning. Twins have had two scoring opportunities against Han. In each case, first and second, and one out. And couldn't get the run in or a run in. Suzuki Escobar and Schaefer. Twins have two hits against Han. Dozier's one out double in the first. And Schaefer's leadoff single in the third. On the outside corner. Down the right field line, and a long run for Smith. Still running. And a nice backhanded catch on the warning track. Foul territory. One down, that'll bring up Escobar. Wolves Weekly is your all access pass to the Timberwolves. Don't miss a special summer edition of Wolves Weekly as we take a look at the team's busy offseason. Plus, get to know the new young faces on the roster. Get a preview of what lies ahead before the season kicks off in October. Wolves Weekly premieres Thursdays at 8 p.m. only on Fox Sports North. Eduardo Escobar fouled out to Alonzo. His first time up and he takes ball one. It's two and oh. It might be that as soon as tomorrow Danny Santana will get a start at short Escobar might be out of the lineup and might play somewhere else in the infield. It's to the left field corner foul he right now has 300 at bats this year. The most he'd ever gotten in a season at this level was last year 165 at bats he. Been about half his time in Rochester. Tapper left side, backhanded by Cabrera, throwing across, two away. Meanwhile, four hours south of here in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, Joe Bauer went one for three as the designated hitter for his brother Jake, the manager of the Colonels. And Ricky Nolasco gave up a couple of hits, no runs in three and two thirds innings through. 50 pitches, 30 strikes. The best guess, and it's just a guess, but the best guess is that Maurer would return to the major league team sometime when we are in Houston. That's if everything goes well, according to manager Ron Gardner. Strike one to Schaefer. For an Alaska, you can imagine them wanting to start with 50 pitches, work their way up to 70, 80, 90. So it'll be a little bit longer, one would think, for him. Strike two taken by Jordan Schaefer, who singled on the first pitch he saw as a twin, stole second on the next pitch, and then on the next pitch, tried to advance on a ground ball to short and was thrown out at third. And he's gone on three pitches. And now seven in a row set down by Jesse Hahn. He's got a one nothing lead.
Sunday so far nothing on the board. Here's a look at the AT&T fan photo of the game. Tweet your photo to hashtag North fan photo for a chance to be shown in an upcoming game broadcast brought to you by AT&T. <laughs> That's not Dan Gladden. It is on the left. <laughs> Tommy Medina will lead things off in the sixth. First pitch popped up. And Suzuki back, but has no play. Medina, Jerko, and Venable in the sixth. Medica with a foul out to first and a uh, was called out on strikes in the fourth. And on the outside corner. The uh, guy who had been running the show for the Padres, uh, A.J. Hinch, left the organization today. And it is assumed that the Padres very shortly will name a full time general manager. And a strikeout of medical one away. Target field suites are available for single game rental for groups of 16 to 96. You can choose from premier suites, the flexible event suites, or the very spacious skyline suites. And coming to a Twins game, an extra special experience by renting a private suite for an upcoming game. Find out more by visiting twinsbaseball.com or by calling 833 Twins. Jerko has been called out twice on strikes by Mike DeMuro. That's the pitch that's gotten it. Cutter over the inside corner. That might have been the breaking ball. Yeah, I think that was a uh, breaking ball, but the same idea. Kind of started it right at the hitter and broke it back over the plate. Same pitch there. Yeah, that's something that uh, one of many things that Kyle Gibson did really well on Sunday. He had threw a lot of breaking balls early in the count. Sometimes first pitch getting the over breaking ball, and he mixed up his pitches. I thought really well. Tap foul, a foul tip. Suzuki hangs on two down and another strikeout. Three really good breaking balls. The first two of which, here's the uh, strikeout pitch that starts out middle of the plate, breaks to the outside corner. Real good strikeout pitch there. The first two, he really was working on uh, in the bullpen with pitching coach Rick Anderson. And Rick Anderson said, uh, told him and told me that this is what their conversation was about um, later on. He said, look, and Rick stood up there like he was a right hand hitter and said throw that curveball right at me throw it right at me because Phil was trying to make these great nasty curveball pitches on the outside corner and he said throw strike one with it throw it right at me and let it break over the plate just see how that works that's exactly what he did to Jerko there just a couple of real sharp breaking curveballs that start at the hitter and break over and get two strikes then throw in the nasty one to strike him out. Couple of fastballs burning the outside corner. Uses match the season high with nine strikeouts tonight. And a breaking ball in the dirt. I know Rick Anderson has uh, has got to have a pretty high sense of uh, pride and, and happiness about uh, Phil Hughes taking what they worked on in the bullpen, taking it out there in the game, and having it be successful. And another two out hit this one running toward the gap and it'll get all the way to the fence. Venable will glide to second base with a two out double. Every hit for the Padres except for the leadoff home run by Alonzo has come with two outs and it's odd that it's only the home run by Alonzo that's been the only hit that's really mattered. Right. Venable's been very very hot got a two strike curveball after seeing some of those and. It's a it's a little bit tougher pitch to get by a left hander left hand hitter generally lo lower ball hitters and uh, Venable's been swinging it well so with two strikes 
maybe one uh, one curveball too many right there, but wasn't a bad pitch. And now missing the inside corner, Rondall has singled and struck out. Side again, two and zero. Oh. And Escobar sneaking behind the runner, no throw. That play, that pickoff play, only works if the pitcher is expecting you to break behind the runner and turns just as soon as he sees the break. Little flare, and Dozier makes a nice running catch to close out the Padres six. Bottom of the six, and the Padres still have a one nothing lead. Toyota, the annual clearance event is going on now. Toyota, let's go places. By Sanford Orthopedics and Sports Medicine for the everyday competitor in all of us. And by McDonald's, where a French vanilla McCafe iced coffee is just $1.59 all summer long. Danny Santana will lead things off for the Twins, still looking to get their first run on the board. Here tonight, after scoring 32 runs in three games in Chicago, I asked you this in Chicago: uh, how much the ballpark itself can dictate how a team does. And I think we all expected the Twins and the White Sox were going to score some runs in Chicago. But generally, that, that has to be a big factor. This has been no more of a pitcher's ballpark than the hitter's ballpark. I think you're absolutely right. I, there's so much. In baseball, and I think in all sports, but especially in baseball, about the influence by the expectation of success. And the Twins have hit well in U.S. Cellular Field. The ball flies out of there real easily. I think as a hitter, you step in the box and you just feel like, let me just get a pitch I can square up because good things are going to happen. The bunt up the line, and Santana is going to get a bunt hit. And immediately, Alonso looks into the dugout saying, let's challenge that. But Black will come out and stall talking with Mike DeMuro until he gets a thumbs up from his video guy. Well, I think there are two things to look at whether he tagged him or not, or whether he's went out of the baseline to avoid the tag. See Alonzo there reaching. He th I think he thinks he got the back of Santana's jersey. I think he's right. I think uh, 
He got the back of Santana's jersey. Now here comes Bud Black, and I think he's going to pick up the other appeal with Marvin Hudson. Whether Santana left the base path. Right. But watch the back, the 39, right there. I think it ruffles a little bit, doesn't it? It, it, it looked to me like it like it ruffled. If, if the play at the plate <laughs> ruffled the uh, Padres uh, uniform, I think that one did too. Pretty good play by Alonzo. See what the folks in New York say. Gentleman on the right is Hunter Wendelstead. He is a crew chief. I think we've mentioned this before. Both Wendelstead and the home plate umpire Mike DeMuro are second generation major league umpires. We're showing the replay up on the scoreboard here and not a whole lot of cheering. I don't think Twins fans are convinced that this hit is going to stand. It wasn't much of uh, contact, but it sure seemed like it ruffled the 39. All right. But you don't know. He also, the uniform could move as he throws his arms up. And the play was ruled safe. They have to have evidence to overturn it. Honesty wouldn't work, would it? I mean, to speed things up, just go to Santana and say, hey, did he get you? <laughs> would, would that work? I mean, are baseball players honest enough where Santana would say, yeah, he got me? You know the answer. <laughs> so this has been a long challenge here, and I think the longer it goes, the better it views it might mean for the Twins. I could be perfectly honest in that situation if I were Danny Santana and someone said that to me I'd say you know honestly that's not my job to get that call right. that's the umpire's job and so I'll leave it to him. Yeah there needs to be an angle and a clear and convincing uh, evidence that the call on the field was incorrect. And I just would guess that the longer this goes the more likely it is. The more likely it would be that Santana will stay at first base. There's a snap of the wrist, but I don't know that there's any clear and convincing evidence that he got the back of his jersey. Yeah, I don't know how they, I don't know how they would uh, view that clear and convincing. It looked to me like he ruffled the 39 on his back a little bit. But hopefully, there won't be enough evidence to overturn with the call on the field. Again, we wouldn't be waiting now if the Padres had challenged the play at home in the top of the second inning and if they had lost that challenge. But Black waited, as most managers want to do, until you get to the middle or late innings. This has been a very long review. Yeah, it really has. I'm surprised by the length of it. Out. They ruled that Santana's jersey was brushed. And so a bunt attempt instead becomes an out. And a nice play by Yonder Alonzo. Brian Dozier will hit with one out in the sixth. Dozier with a double and a walk. Strike one. That bunt by Santana points up something else I think is important. Another weapon in Danny Santana's arsenal. It wasn't a great bunt, but it was with his speed, it takes a, such a good play. Change up on the outside corner to, to Brian quickly, 0 and 2. But it, it just takes such a good play by a, a fielder, either pitcher, first baseman, or second baseman. When you have that kind of speed and you can bunt that well. One and two to Dozier. The odds are really in, in, in enough in Danny's favor. I, I think he could bunt 300. And 
So for him to lay it down every once in a while, they're good odds in his favor. It just takes too good a play. The bunts don't have to be that great when you run that well. Rozier fights off a slow breaking ball to keep the at bat alive. Santana, 0 for 3. And again, you look up, and the Twins have just a couple of hits, one of them by Dozier. Wicked shot, and he's got another hit, and he might try to make it two here. And Dozier will go to second. A wicked smash past Nelson. And Dozier's aboard with what I presume will be ruled his second double of the game. Yeah, that needs to be a double. He hammered that ball past the third baseman. He's got no chance. Stay, stays on that breaking ball with two strikes very nicely. Waits, waits, throws the big end. And drives it on a one hop line past Nelson for a double. Twins have had uh, now three runners, four runners to second base. You have to get a runner to third. Off the plate, ball one. Here's where I think Trevor has to understand. This is part of the maturation of a hitter. But he's got to understand. He's been the hottest guy, at least out of the Chicago series. He's he's been on fire. He needs to drive in this run. Get a ball that he can that he can drive the uh, the run in. Good Slow breaking ball. Too good low. good take there. Understand that with a tying run at second base, the scouting report and the. Pitching behavior of Han is not going to change. He's going to stay away from him here. Look for the ball out there and, and, and drive the ball to right center. Three and oh, Willingham on deck. There's three pitches in a row out there, and he's not going to give in. And Trevor's been hot. They all know that. Trevor's got to know that he's swinging it well, too. So he lays off the pitches that are off. But don't take a good fastball to hit on just outside middle. Looking for that one time in four at bats, he might throw it inside. He's going away. He just will go away. And a slow break. Three and ball all. Three and all. Oh. We'll bring up Willingham. Now on FoxSportsNorth.com, you can view photos from tonight's game and get Tyler Mason's analysis. What would the Wolves lineup look like with Andrew Wiggins and the latest from Vikings training camp, including hearing from Adrian Peterson? There's a situation, pretty mature pitching uh, strategy, and, uh, as the uh, pitching coach for San Diego makes a uh, quick trip to the mound to talk about how they're going to go at Josh Willingham. But that's exactly the point. First base open. Trevor Plouffe, a you know, much hotter hitter right now than either Willingham or the young man just called up from Double A, Kenny Vargas, on deck. So Han was not going to let Trevor beat him. Absolutely wasn't going to give him anything to hit with first base open. Now go to work on uh, Willingham and Vargas. Darren Ballsley heads back to the dugout. He's the pitching coach for the Padres. Willingham is over two. Came up in the spot in the first inning and fouled out to the catcher and let off the fourth with a grounder to short. And again, Josh had a miserable day on Sunday. Everybody else seemed to have fun. We can uh, have a little fun here with runners at first and second and one down. And I don't think they're going to change their strategy. I think they're going to go right back out there, outside corner or nothing. Came inside He's, with the fastball. He, he, he just missed, and and the catcher was sitting on the outside corner, and he missed back in. And you can't let that affect you. That that's not where he wants to get Josh Willingham out. Josh got to got to got to believe that the fastballs are going to be on the outside part of the plate, or or he's going to get breaking balls. Swings through a breaking ball. 0 and 2. So many clutch hits. Most of them coming late Sunday afternoon. Wayne Boyer, a right hander. Alex Torres, a left hander. And the Audrey Bullpen. Two strikes. Just off the corner with a. Slider. I was change up. Change up. Yeah. yeah. 
But again, the most important thing was your call there, just off the corner. <laughs> Change up down and away. Two and two. That's the pitch Bud Black said today. He really thinks we'll separate on eventually adding command of the, of the third pitch. Seen a decent enough fastball with good location. Very good breaking ball, but it's the change up there encouraging him to use more. Now here he's pulled it out of his back pocket twice with the game on the line in the sixth. Two and two. And a foul tip into the dirt. And back to the breaking ball. Well, I agree with man, his manager, Bud Black. I, I think the changeup is going to be the pitch that enables him to get left handers out consistently going forward. There's a guy that knew how to throw fastballs and changeups right there. Bud Black, he knows all about, in his case, getting right hand hitters out. The guy stand on the opposite side of the plate from where you throw. And that's what this young man, Jesse Hahn, is going to need to do against left handers. 79 pitches for Hahn, number 80 coming. Flared foul. Another change. Josh a pretty good swing right there. He's uh, seen enough of him now, and he and I think he knows that uh, that he's got to wait a long time. You see the first pitch fastball. This at bat, 90 mile an hour. Uh, that actually was a mistake. That came back on the inside part of the plate. Everything else has been slow and away. Curveballs and changeups, trying to hit the outside corner or. Off the plate and down, trying to make Josh get himself out. Two and two to Willingham. Foul. Another change. -up. And we talked before about how you get a pitch to hit and foul it off, and then it's the nasty one that strikes you out that you remember. But it's the pitches early in the count that you should have hit. There's a, an example right there. Josh actually waited on that change up very well. Looked like he was on it. Ball was up a little bit. Everything worked in his favor, and he just grounded and foul. That's one that Josh feels like he, he might have had a real good shot at. Another 2 2. Breaking ball got him. So he threw him a first pitch fastball, and then everything was soft after that. Two down, and that'll bring up Vargas. That's just a real big, quick breaking ball. Josh thinks he's on it, swings at it, disappears below his back. Vargas swung over a breaking ball striking out in this exact same spot in the first inning and then creamed a fastball lining out to the center fielder in the fourth. So what do you think he's going to get. Probably the soft stuff. Yeah I think so. Might show him one fastball in there. Well, he's going to go right to the breaking ball and I, I just think that's where he's going to stay. Yeah I just think he's going to he's going to stay with that breaking ball. He might show him a fastball off the plate. I, I just don't think that he and the catcher think there's any reason to throw him anything else. Vargas will have to prove that he can yeah, hit that pitch. Absolutely. Especially with a game on the line like this. One strike to the Twins first baseman. Fastball yep, off the plate. Yep, there's the fastball off the plate. And, and here, I'm going to throw you this one so you think you're going to get it for a strike, but you're not going to get it for a strike. One and one. Blasted to right field. Gone. A three run home run on a curveball. And he proved he could hit it. His first major league home run. 
and it left no doubt at all when it left home plate. And that's just the strength of this young man right here. Not a bad curveball, a little bit up in the strike zone. But he just hammered it. You know, he's right. The ball does carry pretty well here. <laughs> well, it does when you hit it like that. <laughs> and now a called strike to Arcia. Oh, that's a beautiful thing for the young man. I'd love to know if he was sitting on that curveball. It sure looked like he, he was. Off the outside corner, one on one. And if that's the case, I think a lot of credit goes to him. To that young man being, <laughs> he said, he said, oh, I've hit one farther. I hit one way past that. <laughs> A lot of the credit goes to the maturity of that young man, Kenny Vargas. But also, I feel pretty sure that Tom Brunanski was in his ear saying, look, they're just what we were saying up here. They're going to make you show them that you can hit breaking balls because that's what you're going to get for strikes or anything close. Two and two to Arcia. And good for that man right there and the young man for having the poise to uh, either look for that breaking ball or at least wait long enough, look for the fastball away so that he can wait long enough to adjust to the curve. Either way, he was on, just on that curveball speed well enough to allow his strength to take over. And Arcia checked his swing, picked up his back foot, avoided getting hit by the pitch. Two, or excuse me, three and two now. And foul. Still marveling at how fast that ball of Vargas hit got out of the ballpark. Full count to Arcia. And he takes a walk. So in the inning, Gozier's second double, a walk to Plouffe. And Vargas's uh, three run home run, and suddenly it's the end of the night for Jesse Hahn. Uh, Black coming out to make a change here. Being shut down for five innings by Jesse Hahn, but in just his fourth major league game. Kenny Vargas hits his first major league home run. Boyer will pick up the game with three runs in and two outs in the bottom of the sixth. Innings without allowing a home run, but he gave up a big one to Kenny Vargas. The Twins are in front. Hahn left the ball game now with a runner at first and two down. Blaine Boyer coming in for the 19th time. 
He, he's pitched very well, Dick. Look at the strikeout to walk ratio. That's terrific. Opponent batting average. He's been very, very good. And face Suzuki with a runner at first and two down. RC at first, Suzuki 0 for 2, hitting a fly ball to right, and then a foul fly to right in his two prior at bats. Strike one. Reds beat the Indians 9 to 2. Texas is all over the White Sox 10 to nothing. Detroit, New York. Tied at three in the bottom of the ninth. Swing and a miss, 0 and 2. And just underway in the bottom of the second inning, Arizona leading Kansas City. You know, Dick, we were talking in Chicago about uh, the three run home run. Yeah. <laughs> and with two outs, no less. Two strikes to Kurt Suzuki. And foul to the screen. And sending at least seven men to the plate here in the sixth. Dozier's double has started at least a three run rally and another foul back off the bat of Suzuki. Boyer to Suzuki. There goes Arcia. And a breaking pitch. And Arcia slides the base. Well, Arcia is second steal in four tries. Well, a nice call there. Pretty good jump by uh, Arcia. Ron Gardenhire betting on a breaking ball there with two strikes to uh, Suzuki. So he gets a pretty good, good pitch. They're sending Arcia back. And I don't know whether time was called or what happened, but Arcia will not get a stolen base. And now Mike DeMuro offering an explanation to Bud Black when, in fact, it's Twins manager Ron Gardner who might have the better question. What happened? Why did my guy not get a stolen base? And the only thing I can guess is that time was called. Suzuki was in the batter's box. The bat may have interfered with Grandal's throw. Well, it, that that's not catcher's interference. No, or that, I mean the batter's interference. No, not at all. No, I, I'm, uh, I wish we could enlighten you, but right. I'm baffled. Grandal's glove hand may have made contact with Suzuki, but it didn't impede the throw to second base. At least didn't appear that way to me. But no stolen base for Arcia. And a call third strike. Suzuki will head back to the dugout, put on the catching gear. He'll come out in the seventh inning with the Twins in front, three to one. Thanks to Kenny Vargas's first major league home run.
Philadelphia on home runs. Well, Phil Hughes pitching very, very well. Just gave up the one home run, but uh, to uh, Alonzo, maybe the only bad or regrettable pitch that he's made. Jesse Hahn, uh, meanwhile, very, very good. Big breaking curveball. Fastball, he refused to give in, just throwing on the outside corner until Kenny Vargas got up with two men on, sitting on breaking ball. And when this man hits them, they stay hit. A three run <laughs> home run to give the Twins a three to one lead going to the top of the seven. Phil Hughes can pick up his 11th win if the Twins bullpen does its job. First man asked to pitch uh, out of the pen is left hander Caleb Fieldbar. Fieldbar has been good most of the season. Ran into a bit of a hiccup in uh, Kansas City. Didn't have great command. Uh, it, there, part of a uh, bit of a uh, surprising bullpen uh, meltdown for uh, three, four games, but it seemed to have righted the ship. And field bar's been good. Alonzo with a big swing again. Those are the types of swings he took against Phil Hughes, and he creamed a couple of them a double off the wall in right, and then a home run into the second deck in right center. One thing that we that I've noticed about Caleb Fieldbar is when he's not sharp, he comes in and throws ball one instead of strike one. That's a nice curveball right there. I don't know how Lonzo doesn't swing at that pitch. That's a great spot for that curveball. When 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 Fieldbar is not sharp, he comes in ball one, ball two. It doesn't happen very often. It happened in Kansas City. Well, second pitch had plenty of the plate, and that one I guess missed two and one. The ball looked like it was a little, might have been a little low. I thought I thought the uh, first one was pretty close. First curveball popped up. Escobar retreats and makes the catch. One away. We'll bring up Nelson. Twins fans, if you need help to replace those old flip flops you've been wearing all summer, the Twins can help. Just be among the first 10,000 fans at the game Wednesday, August 20th, when the Twins take on the Indians. It's fan flip flop night presented by the beaches of Fort Myers and Sanibel. You can call 800 33 Twins. Visit twinsbaseball.com to get your tickets. They'd go very well with the Zubas you might have a chance to get in September. Zubas and flip flops. Uh, what a what a fashion statement. That was the uniform in the 90s, wasn't it? One strike to Chris Nelson. And a strike over two. That's a big slow curveball right there. And, and uh, Thielbar so far kind of showing what I'm talking about here about coming in, throwing strikes. The only time I've ever seen him struggle, it's like he just doesn't have command. And you can see a 20 mile an hour speed differential between pitches. And I, I guarantee you. There's 91. I guarantee you when you see a 68 mile an hour curveball, then 91, that 91 looks more like 95. One and two. I'll step back and out of play. Rick Anderson calling out to the bullpen. Somebody will start to get loose. Sometimes, you know, you go through a newspaper, you look at the box scores, you can tell which team is playing well just by A, how many pitchers are being used in a game, and whether there are any fractions of innings. Swing and a miss on an off speed pitch. Two down. When you see, as we might see here, starter goes six. One guy goes one, another guy goes one, and another guy goes one. Well, you know, the team's playing pretty well. Real good breaking ball right there from Caleb Thielbar. A little bit harder than the slow 68 mile an hour one he, he threw. And that's that's very, very effective when you can throw breaking balls at different speeds because a hitter can recognize the spin on the curveball. He recognizes it, that it's coming up there as a breaking ball. But he swings at one that he saw before rather than the one that he's getting right now. And in the dirt, ball one. Saw Presley warming up. 
might pitch next behind Thielbar. Thielbar being asked to pitch a clean seventh inning. White Sox who gave up 16 runs to the Twins on Sunday they have given up 14 more to the Rangers tonight. They're still playing. Seventh inning. Two and zero. Oh. Through the hole to left. The tying run will come to the plate. We'll see if the Twins make a move here. And yet another two out hit for the Padres. They have eight hits, seven of them with two outs. The run produced by the one other hit, a leadoff home run. Fox Sports North welcomes the U.S. Bank Minnesota Timberwolves caravan. Traveling to Owatonna, St. Cloud, and Eau Claire on August 6th uh, through the 8th. You can join the Wolves for free youth basketball clinics with instruction from Timberwolves players Corey Brewer and Ronnie Turiaf. For more information, visit foxsportsnorth.com. Click on the More tab. Here's Solarte. We'll see how uh, Ron Gardenhire uh, plays this. Hopefully, uh, Caleb Fieldbar will get Solarte out, who's a switch hitter. He's got Seth Smith up left who's a left handed hitter so my my thought with the right hander out in the bullpen when he got up was that maybe he was uh, taking precaution against a bigger inning and, and the right hander would pitch to Tommy Medica. Wouldn't have thought that Presley would uh, pitch against either the switch hitter right now or the left hander Seth Smith. And he takes a fastball strike one. A center and a base hit. And Smith will come up with the tying run on. And Fieldbar giving up a pair of two out singles. First two outs came pretty easy. Now a pair of hits. And Smith will get his at bat against the lefty Fieldbar. Well, fastball that was up in the zone. Fieldbar tends to pitch up there a little bit, and it's effective because of the big uh, curveball that starts high up there at the hitter's eye angle up there, but and then breaks down. But that high fastball that it can uh, get him in trouble. This will be his last hitter, one way or the other. I'm pretty sure. I, I probably this was. Uh, it's uh, medic on deck that would be the. Uh, the Job of the right hander. This is Steel Bar's guy right here. He needs to get the left hander up. Breaking ball hits the corner. And that's the pitch that he threw uh, earlier to uh, Alonzo. I think same pitch to that left hand hitter that DeMiro didn't call a strike, but that's a that's a good pitch. That's a strike. On the season, Steel Bar's actually had better success against right handers than left handers. But a big at bat here against Smith. One and one. Run is at first. Bar misses Suzuki's target. It's two and one. Medica on deck. Breaking ball taken for strike two. Bar able to throw his curve for strikes. And he's thrown two of them taken by Smith. Well, he's going to have to throw a good one here. They got away with one there up in the strike zone. He's going to have to come back with a good one. There's a good one. Tapped up the line. Foul. Smith just getting a piece of that, rolling it up the first baseline.
Smith hitting 242 against left handed pitching with only six of his. Uh, how many 30 some RBIs I thought I saw 32. RBIs this is the guy that Caleb needs to get. Two and two. Knocked down by Theobar. Inning over. Again two out hits are left the board of the Twins lead three one. And this copyrighted telecast is presented by authority of the Minnesota Twins and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form. And the accounts and descriptions of this game may not be disseminated without the express written consent of Minnesota Twins LLC. Caleb Fieldbar gave up a couple of singles, uh, leaving them harmless singles by getting out of the inning, leaving two men aboard. Eduardo Escobar will lead off the seventh for the Twins. Escobar takes outside ball one. Escobar, Jordan Schaefer, and Danny Santana. Driven foul. That's to center, and it'll die in short center. And Escobar is aboard with Jordan Schaefer coming to the plate. Yeah, guys, I talked to Jordan this afternoon. He's very excited to play for the Minnesota Twins and said his time in Atlanta just never worked out. He said it was tough. You get out there every seven to ten days. Your timing wasn't there. He said no matter what you do in the cage, you cannot simulate in that batter's box facing top pitchers. And all of a sudden you're out there against Zach Greinke. You have the time of your life, he said. He's looking forward to playing more. And he knows he's a better hitter than the numbers he's put up. And he did talk about the fact that he can steal a base or two. And he's excited to bring some speed and energy into this lineup. And we've seen the good and the bad of that already tonight, guys. Yes, we have. Talked with uh, Jordan uh, during batting practice today. His first question to me was, "When does it get cold here?" <laughs> He's played uh, with uh, his home clubs being Houston and Atlanta, and I said, "You don't have anything to worry about. It doesn't get cold here till long after the baseball season." And he was asking about April, and I said, "Let's not talk about April. We're talking about August and September." And Schaefer squares takes ball one. Playing left field today, but most of his time professionally has been spent in center. And wouldn't surprise me at all if he's not the center fielder tomorrow for the Twins. We'll 
Hawks have to wait until we get to the ballpark tomorrow morning. It's a noon game tomorrow. Quick turnaround. In the air, back to the screen and out of play. Well, it's such an interesting scenario with uh, Jordan Schaefer and Danny Santana as we look at the night that he's had so far. First of that, first pitch he sees just whacks a single into uh, right field for a base hit. Takes off for a second, turns on the Jets at first slide. Stolen base. And then a very nice little running shoestring type catch in left field. So a nice debut for uh, Jordan Schaefer. It'd be really, really nice for him to be in the middle of a rally here in the bottom of the seventh for the Twins. And I was just going to say it's an interesting uh, situation with uh, Danny Santana playing center field. Jordan Schaefer, a very experienced center fielder, could go out there. But then where does Danny Santana play? If he's not going to play shortstop, he's going to play center, even though right. this is his first year ever playing center. Ron and Garden are sure not going to mess with Danny's mind putting him in left or right. right. I mean, that's where he's been playing. So that's where he's staying. And the center fielder Schaefer is going to just have to play left field. As long as Danny's in, 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 not going to play shortstop. It's a minor league move, but it might impact uh, the complexion of things up here. Aaron Hicks today was promoted from double A to triple A. There's a bunt out of the mound. And. Jerko gets there, a sacrifice getting Escobar into a scoring position. And while it's not directly related to the center field situation here yet, it was a necessary step that had to be made at some point before Aaron Hicks ever reappears up here. I think everyone was in agreement that Hicks sent down to double A, hopefully rediscovering something in his swing. He was hitting right around 300. And Terry Ryan moving him up to triple A. Now that might, might also be intriguing because now there's an opening at double A in the outfield, and that might bring uh, Byron uh, Buxton up uh, to the double A level. Well, I hope what that means, first and foremost, I hope that Aaron Hicks is starting to find his stroke a little bit uh, as a switch hitter. Really hope that that's what that means for that for that young man. And, and yes, play out triple A this year and 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 next. Prove to himself, find a stroke, prove to himself that he can doesn't belong down there. And then you think about playing in the big leagues. And I also mean hope it means that Byron Buxton is sufficiently recovered from right. his injuries and he's starting to pl play well and warrants going to the next level also. Santano lifts it foul one and one. You know, you just want you just want kids to play well. Right? You know, you want them to learn. You want him to kind of conquer a level that they're playing, move on to be able to move on to the next one. There's a, a couple of guys right there, Vargas and uh, Arcia, that so far are, are, for the most part, being act, asked to make the jump over Triple A right to the big leagues. Hopped up again, back into the seats. And that's what's interesting. I mean, Santana was considered a prospect. Vargas was considered a prospect. But nobody has been considered uh, the type of prospect that Buxton has been since the Twins drafted Joe Maurer. And uh, when, when Buxton gets to double A, whenever it is, I mean, the clock will, will start. Yes, absolutely right. Absolutely right. Double A is the. It is the leaping off point in, in my opinion in, in, a, in a player's career once you you've conquered double A baseball then you are not that far away you are you are two months of conquering triple A away from being here and in the case of that fellow on the right there that big young strong young man he may be accomplished enough to be able to make that make that jump one and two to Santana trying to add an insurance run here on the seventh and a busted bat pop up to short. Two down. And it'll bring up Brian Dozier on our carsoup.com trivia question. I believe the answer is Randy Jones. That would be my guess too. Eric wow, Shaw. With a hundred on the dot. Another good guess would have been Jake Peavy, but. Yeah, I don't know how we didn't think of PV also, but uh, Randy Jones, a great left-handed pitcher, in my era. Strike one to Dozier. He's had a real good night at the plate. A pair of doubles and a walk. And the 
22 hits have Brian's average up to 244. Well, it's been a while since Brian's hit three doubles. This would be a good time for that. Strike called on two. Jones had 92 wins, as did Jake Peavy. Fouled away. It's tough at bats at late in games against relief pitchers uh, you've uh, never seen before. Brian taking a couple of pitches that, uh, especially the first high fastball, high middle fastball, he, he kind of his pitch. We look at Fieldbart. Who did his job? Got through the uh, seventh to get to Casey Fien in the eighth. It, it, you know, Thielbar's inning was gigantic because obviously it sets up the eighth, ninth inning tandem that Ron Gardner likes to use. Foul back. Like we were talking about in the seventh, and Presley was loosening up in order to pitch to uh, Medica if it got that far. But Thielbar able to get the left-handers out that he needed to get out and. Get, gets manager Garden higher to uh, to the eighth inning in Casey Field. And Perkins will very likely have the ninth. Right. Two strikes to Dozier. And inside Dozier. With his quick wrists rounded one sharply into the Padre dugout. Jeff Rancour back in the big leagues. Rancour saying, who almost got hit, he's saying, hit, hit it out there. <laughs> what the heck? Hit it between the lines. Dozier again will get an 0 2 pitch. Now 1 and 2. Very curious how Dozier's final two months go. He's emerged as a supreme defender, power hitter, and steal a base, and the one nit to pick might be his batting average, but now that seems to be on the climb too. Foul back. Leads the team with 92 strikeouts, but the strikeouts have been fewer and farther between. Brian likes to pull the ball, especially in this ballpark, because he feels like the only play, only hits out there in gaps or uh, over the fence are from left center to the left field line and so he tends to be a pull hitter here and if he's if that's going to be his approach then the one thing that he's going to really need to do is right here with be, become a better two strike hitter hitting the ball up the middle and, and the other way so that he can adjust to more kinds of pitches. Half foul. This has been a battle. Yeah this is a good battle by uh, Brian right here. But five two strike fouls in this at bat. Boyer's got good stuff. He really does. It's it, it's been a battle for uh, for Brian, and he's just got to stay with both fastball and that breaking ball. Popped up right side. Alonzo at the railing leaps and makes a catch. Yonder Alonzo had it in his glove. Did he hang on? No, I think that little guy in the camel hat has, has the ball now, but that was one heck of an effort. I, yeah, I think you're right. I think he did have it in his glove. Yep. Yeah. Hit him. He hit some glove, but he just, as he went down, he just couldn't corral. What a, what a great effort. Great effort by that young man. 
And at least one more pitch in this Dozier at bat. Now a two and two. Zipping a 94 mile per hour fastball up around the hands. Yeah, as I said, Blair's got good stuff. He can throw it up there pretty quick. The ball's got some movement running in on right handers, and then the slider comes back the up, goes back away the other direction. Tough to be ready for both of them. And now a full there. count. Really good take right there by Brian. Wood. Very, would have been very, very easily for after that ball inside at 94 for him to jump out after it, not take a long look at that slider. He saw it early and was able to lay off of it. That's a nice take. Full count now, six two strike fouls. Seven foul balls after the second strike. Now you want the payoff don't you you battled and you worked the count full you want to get a, a cookie to hit and pound it hard someplace right. Absolutely. You, you know you're you're having a good battle right here you know you're kind of winning against the pitcher right here you want to pay it off. Another foul ball eight of them now with two strikes. And when I say winning as you fought back from 0 and 2. And it's not it's not exactly that you you're winning the bat because you're having great swings. It's just that you've gotten back into a manageable count where the pitcher has to throw a strike. Most likely will want to throw a strike with Trevor Proof on deck. And so that makes it a little bit easier because you can be a little bit more uh, aggressive up the middle on fastball because the slider has to be a strike. You can't, you can't afford to throw you that nasty one way away that you might be. He might be out in front of so you want to pay it off as if you can. Bryant's had a good battle. And there's a payoff, a drive to center. Venable with the catch and the gap. Escobar left at second. It's still three to one. Head to the eighth inning. And Casey Fiend comes out of the bullpen, hoping to do what Caleb the field bar did. Pitch a scoreless inning of relief. Casey, very, very good. Kind of taking over that eighth inning role, set up man for Glenn Perkins. What we all love about Casey Fiend the most is his. Mentality about coming right at the hitters. It's going to be whatever he's got for strikes most of the time. It'll be Medica, Jerko, and Venable, the four, five, and six batters. 
Padres have a solo home run. The Twins have a three run home run. That's been it. In San Diego, the Twins won the two games by scores of five to three, two to nothing. And another low scoring ball game, even though the Twins are coming off their epic series in Chicago, and the Padres have scored more runs than any other National League team since the All Star break. Phil Hughes and Jesse Hahn both pitched very, very well. Strike one. Holding the score down. Twins did a good job of getting some guys on for their uh, fourth and fifth hitters, and the fifth hitter came through. Kenny Vargas with a big three run blast, a hard three run blast. Our good friend Herman Killebrew used to call those get small quick balls. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> it did. It did. The uh, the ball disappeared long before the crack of the <laughs> bat sound left our ears, that's for sure. That ball was just hammered. And off the plate, one and two. Matica 0 for 3, Jerko 0 for 3 with three strikeouts, and Venable 2 for 3. Since the break, Medica has been the guy for the Padres. And a high fastball. Suzuki with that soft catcher's glove again, one down. Sanford Health injury report. Uh, Andrew McCutcheon, who was hit in the Backbone by a pitch over the weekend. This is an unrelated thing. They originally described it as a strained oblique, but now they're saying it's a fracture of the cartilage in the rib area. And Matt Garza also with a rib cage area injury. They're going to try to keep McCutcheon off the disabled list, but acknowledge that he's going to miss at least a week. One strike to Jerko. Base hit. After striking out three times, Jerko cracks his bat and gets a one out single. And will bring up Will Venable. Another softly hit ball by the Padres. They've gotten a few of those tonight as, as the White Sox did for two consecutive series against the, the Twins. Pretty good pitch by Casey Fiend. Excuse me, Dick. They get a broken bat there. Venable with a ground out to Vargas and a pair of hits, a single and a double. One and zero. Oh. Thayer warming up in the Padre bullpen. Two and zero. Oh. Okay. Go. A little foul over the Padre dugout. Two and one. In the eleventh inning at Yankee Stadium, Tigers and Yankees tied at three. Very pleasant night here at Target Field. And a roller foul off of a leg. Two and two. It is a beautiful night, isn't it? Very little wind. Except that it was created by the ball that Vargas hit. <laughs> blowing out to right field. <laughs> Taking wind with it. Two and two. Popped up to left. Schaefer. With the catch two down. Let's check some Major League Baseball news and notes. Cueto with another great outing this time against the Indians as they battle for the Ohio Cup. 
Daniel Murphy with his 11 three hit game. All star second baseman. Big night for J.P. Aaron Cebio. And a lot of other Texas Rangers. They are leading the White Sox 15 to nothing. That's in Chicago too, isn't it? Yeah. Falling on the heels of 16 to 3 on Sunday. White Sox won a rain shortened game last night. And then the Rangers are well on their way to a win here tonight. 1 and 0 to Grandal, and there's a strike. I was just thinking those kind hearted Chicago fans probably weren't giving the uh, Chicago pitching staff and bullpen any trouble at all tonight. John Danks heard it from the fans reportedly. Sure. Giving up three home runs. Popped up. Loof comes in. Fiend gives up a useless base hit and the Twins still lead three to one. Look. All right, V. Diamond Cutter is right. TK'd be proud. Three one twins as we head to the bottom of the eighth stage directly after the game for Twins Live presented by Century Link. We'll take a look back at a mammoth home run, the first in the bigs for big Kenny Vargas. We'll break down Phil Hughes' performance. Rock solid again, mixing up those pitches to keep the Padres off balance. We'll take you inside the Twins' clubhouse and hear from the manager, Ron Gardner. We'll see if the Twins can close the deal, guys, and win their third straight. All right, thank you very much, Kevin. Twins in front here. Trevor Plouffe will lead off the eighth inning. One other footnote as you look at the new pitcher for the uh, Padres, right-hander Dale Thayer, often used reliever. One other footnote about the game in Chicago. In the ninth inning, the White Sox are putting on the mound Adam Dunn. The big DH first baseman getting a chance to pitch. Now, the announced attendance a little over 21,000. You can imagine most of them left by the ninth inning. And I wonder how many of them got on the freeway and turned around. And wanting to get back to the ballpark just to see that. <laughs> Two strikes. That's a blue. big body out there on that pitcher rubber. So would you say then with the old expression would you yell out. After a big. Game like that put a fork in him he's done. You might. <laughs> I, I don't I think I would choose not to but you might No, I'm just I yeah, was asking I you if you were, would do that one down in the eighth inning with the twins in front three to one let's get caught up well a lot to catch up on really there was a uh, home run way up in the upper deck by uh, who hit that ball uh, Alonzo I think and then a three run blast by uh, Kenny Vargas his first big league home run and that has been the extent of the scoring here. Mark is going to get another chance here in the bottom of the eighth. Willingham over three. 
Yonder Alonzo hit that ball. He's had a nice ball game. Hit it double off the wall, a home run in the upper deck, and almost made a spectacular diving into the stands catch. One and one to Willingham. This one threw a breaking ball, leaving two men aboard in the sixth. But a few moments later, Vargas hit a breaking ball for a three run home run. This one lifted high and fairly deep to right. Smith in front of the overhang makes the catch, two down. We'll bring up Kenny Vargas. Our subway in game box score a three run home run by the fifth place hitter. Taking the game from one nothing San Diego to three to one Minnesota. The fans who may have listened on the radio might have watched on TV in Chicago, but the ones here tonight in person got to see Vargas's mammoth power and his first major league home run. Strike at the knees. Fox tracks presented by Carrier. To the screen, two strikes. So here's what we know about Vargas. He can be struck out with a breaking ball out of the strike zone. Just don't throw it for a strike. Right? Exactly right. Exactly right. And don't just, you can't throw it for a strike after he's seen a bunch of them. We know that. Off the pitcher. Picked up by the shortstop, and Vargas is retired. And it's a one, two, three, bottom of the eighth inning. Join us tomorrow afternoon for the second game of this two-game series between the Twins and the Padres. We're going to start with Twins Live presented by CenturyLink at 11.30. First pitch from Target Field at noon. That's tomorrow afternoon on Fox Sports North. And then it's back on the road for a week. Four in Oakland, three in Houston. The Twins, as short as the homestand is, would like to make it a successful one. And Glenn Perkins can uh, take a huge step in that direction with a successful save opportunity. One of the premier closers in the game, all star Glenn Perkins, who not only has saved 27 games here in the American League, he's uh, a twin schedule. He saved the all star victory for the American League in the all star game. As you see, Chris Parmelee taking over at Defensive duties at first base for Kenny Vargas. Yonder Alonzo will lead things off in the ninth. Perkins misses outside, ball one. Alonzo with a double off the fence in right center, a home run over the fence in right center, and a pop up to short. Alonzo, Nelson, Cabrera scheduled. And a strike, one and one.
on the outside corner one and two. Nelson in the on deck circle. Hope to right a base hit. Comes who's given up a lot of base hits with the fastball. Gives one up on the slider leading off the ninth inning. They get the tying run to the plate in Nelson. Century link linked to what's next. Kevin Correa going for the Twins. Odra Sommer de Spain will start for the Padres. Cuban pitcher who's pitched very well. And a strike over the inside corner. Wilson with two strikeouts on an 0 for 3 night. Miss the inside corner. Popped up. Armily has a play. One down. And it'll bring up Cabrera. Cabrera. One for three with a walk. Cabrera just three home runs on the year. Solarte just two. If you want to stay away from Seth Smith, he's got 11 home runs. And Perkins, if he can get the next two batters, can leave Smith in the on deck circle. Off the middle of base hit. Going after a first pitch fastball, and now a pair of singles will bring Solarte to the plate. Smith already in the on deck circle. To leave him there, Perkins is going to need a double play grounder. Salarte with two hits, both of them singles. Salarte is a pretty good hitter. We saw him in uh, New York and uh, was aggressive, swung the bat well. The Twins had him in the minor league system for a while, always swung the bat pretty well. Tom Bernanski told me he liked, he liked him. We saw him in the minor leagues, liked him. Defense was going to be a, a question mark. Hopped up to center field. That's a big out. And Santana trots in, out number two. And it'll come down to Perkins against Smith. Lefty against lefty. Smith against lefties as we pointed out before hitting 242 no home run six runs batted in and 0 for 2 in uh, his uh, career against in the just the two at bats he's had against Glenn Perkins outside ball one good choice of pitches there by Perkins and Suzuki. Pretty good slider. Just off the plate. Smith didn't off at it, but they had there's an after that fastball. To left. Schaefer ends it. And the twins start this homestand, brief as it is, with a three to one win. Nice victory for the uh, twins and get a really well pitched ball game by Phil Hughes and Three consecutive pitchers out of the bullpen and a big three run home run by their uh, their young stud here, Kenny Vargas. Three one victory here in front of the hometown fans. And Tom Hanna.